Hi there. So I finally decided I'm going to do a video on the Jacobian matrix. And uh, I essentially have just been interested in it for a while and why it has the attributes it does and, and where it comes from. Uh, so this video was going to be exceptionally long if I didn't uh, write things down beforehand. So here's the first page. Hopefully you're able to see the whole thing. So um, the Jacobian matrix is um, essentially, well, maybe we should just start into it without even trying to define it. So up here in the upper left-hand corner, we have a Cartesian space um, in two dimensions. And you can see we have these basis vectors E1 and E2 for the X and Y directions. Um, now you can see I've drawn these dashed lines because this is linear or the Cartesian space is linear, I suppose. You can use those same basis vectors for any point in the space. But this operator A, which is going to be a non-linear operator, which means that it maps lines to curves, not lines to lines, right? A linear operator would, would map lines to lines. And so as you can see, when we apply the non-linear operator A, we get this very contorted space of which I've called the axes X prime and Y prime. And I also drew the, the light dashed lines here to show you that any given point in space isn't gonna have necessarily the same basis. Um, and so as I move my point X prime and Y prime around, that E2 prime and E1 prime are going to change for, this, for the point they're at. And so uh, for this nonlinear operator, if you take A and you operate on a vector X, Y, it's going to spit out a vector X prime, Y prime in this space. And we can represent X prime and Y prime with two functions. Function one is a function of X and Y, and function two is a function of X and Y. So this really allows us to envelop all the possible nonlinear um, operators and also linear operators. If, if F1 and F2 um, end up being linear functions, well, then you have a linear operator. So in calculus, uh, we tend to create infinitesimal linear approximations to glean information about curves. And as an example over here on the right, um, you'll recall from maybe Calc 1 or Calc 2, depending on the school you're going to, that in Cartesian coordinate system, we used a delta x run and a delta y rise. And we used that in order to calculate um, the arc length. So delta S here is a small bit of arc length and it's linearly approximated. So with calculus, you basically break up a curve into a bunch of tiny little flat lines, DS, right? And you add up every little straight line and that gives you uh, as you know DS approaches zero or I should say as DX approaches zero, this will find you the curve length. The, the arc length of the curve um, when you integrate over the entire curve between your boundaries. So that's just one example of how calculus uses infinitesimal linear approximations to find information about a bigger system as a whole, right? Like you're zooming in on this tiny point on a curve, you're figuring out what you know about that when it's approximated linearly, and then you apply that to the entire curve by using integration. And that can give you the entire curve's arc length. So now going back to our nonlinear operator A, now although it's nonlinear, we could look at a small area of the mapping and approximate it as a local linear operator J, which we're going to call the Jacobian. So essentially, what we're saying is if you look at a small space, say a small infinitesimal area uh, in that xy plane, and you map it over to the X prime Y prime plane, you can actually still treat the infinitesimal area that it's been mapped to as linear. Now, of course, it's not quite linear, but of course, the closer you zoom into um, a curved area, 
or a curved space, the flatter it's going to appear. So using a similar analogy to the arc length, right? The, the further we zoom into a curve, the flatter that segment will look or the more straight it will look. It's the same with the area in the X prime, Y prime plane. And so we're going to go ahead and use this Jacobian matrix to map E1, which is a vector, once again, as a basis for this space over here, we're gonna map it to E1 prime, which is going to be a basis for this small area of this X prime, Y prime coordinate plane. We're also going to use the Jacobian to map E2, the Y basis vector to E2 prime, which is going to be the, the second basis vector for this infinitesimal or very, very small area in the X prime, Y prime plane. And so essentially we're looking at small space here to small space here, and we're going to use a linear approximation to try to glean information about this particular operation while still uh, only using a linear operator J. So as we zoom in, um, you see I've basically drawn these same, the same two areas with their same basis vectors. As you can see down here, the point of interest is x comma y in the x y plane. And then I've got this E1 vector, which points from the point x comma y to the point x plus delta x comma delta y. So we've taken a small step in the x direction to get from point A to point B. And that is represented by the vector E1. And then likewise for E2, we go from x comma y, which is point A, we, tell, we take a delta y small step to point C, which is x comma y plus delta y. And that's represented by the vector E2. So anyways, we're mapping this with the Jacobian to um, this small point in space right over here that we have drawn. And of course, for that point, we have some E1 prime vector and an E2 prime vector. Now, there's likely, you know, because A is nonlinear, these are likely curved. But remember, we're zooming in so close that these are going to start appearing flatter and flatter. And so, in order to figure out where point A ends up after the nonlinear operator acts on it, right, you would take your ordered pair x comma y and you would plug it in to your function one and your function two. Because function one tells you where your x coordinate goes to in the x prime, y prime plane. And function two, f2, tells you where the y point will be mapped to. So in other words, if I'm mapping from x comma y to x prime comma y prime, x prime will be f1 of xy comma f2 of xy. And I'm sorry, x prime will be f1 of x comma y and y prime will be f2 of x comma y. f1 maps from your x to your x prime, f2 maps from your y to your y prime. So then to find b prime, right, we're mapping b to b prime using our nonlinear operator. We would just plug in the ordered pair at b prime into f1 and f2 to find our, our new positions in the x prime, y prime, uh, space. And likewise with C, if we want to map C using the nonlinear operator, we would simply plug in that information of the ordered pair into our F1 to find our X coordinate or our X prime coordinate, and then into F2 to find our Y prime coordinate. So with A doing the mapping, these aren't going to be straight lines but we're gonna pretend like they are straight lines, like we've zoomed in enough to where they are straight vectors. And so the next step is gonna be um, for our linear approximation that the E1 prime vector is gonna be equal to the Jacobian acting on the E1 vector. And our E2 prime vector is gonna be equal to the Jacobian acting on the E2 vector. And if we look at our um, initial picture here, it's it's pretty straightforward to see that the E1 vector is equal to 
delta x in the x direction comma zero in the y direction, right? E1 points only in the x direction and it only points a distance of delta x. And E2 uh, likewise is the vector zero comma delta y. It's not moving at all in the x direction, it's taking a delta y step in the y direction. Now E1 prime and E2 prime get a little more complicated, but it's not all that bad when you remember that if you want to find the vector that points from say A prime to B prime, you simply take the ordered pair that B prime is at and you subtract the ordered pair that A prime is at component wise. So in other words, for the X component of the vector, you would take this F1 of X plus delta X comma Y and subtract the X component of A prime, which is F1 of X comma Y. So that's now our X component for the vector E1 prime. And the Y component is similar. You take the Y component of B prime and you subtract the Y component of A prime. So we have F2 of X plus delta X comma Y minus F2 of X comma Y. So here's our E1 prime vector. Now we use the same concept, right? We're gonna take the ordered pair C prime and subtract the ordered pair A prime component wise and that's gonna give us our E2 prime vector, which ends up being F1 of X comma Y plus delta Y minus F1 of X and Y comma, right? Now the Y components F2 of X comma Y plus Y prime minus F2 of X comma Y. So now we know our E1 vector, our E2 vector and our E1 prime vector that J maps E1 to and our E2 prime vector, which J maps E2 uh, to, okay. So now that we know what these vectors are, we can expand these mappings of these basis vectors. And what you end up finding is um, this column vector here, E1 prime is equal to the Jacobian times this column vector delta X over zero. And similarly filling in the information uh, for the E2 prime mapped from the E2 vector by the Jacobian. So hopefully after taking a minute and looking at these concepts, it'll click as to what exactly is going on here. So at this point, I mean, the goal of this whole endeavor is to figure out what J is, right? We're trying to figure out what the Jacobian is. And so I'm not gonna move to the next page and sharing the whiteboard. Let's see, that's not right. There it is. All right. So I kept the picture, you know, the first picture of the nonlinear map A up here. Um, so we're at this step four, right? Where we've rewritten these um, mappings of our basis vectors in the two different spaces at the two different points in those spaces. And so now at this point, what we do, so as you can see, we've got, this is the X component of E1 prime. This is the Y component of E1 prime. This is the X component of E1, the X component uh, or the Y component of E1. And so as you can see here, we could go ahead and factor a delta X out of both the top and bottom of this column vector uh, E1. And that'll lead us to this step right down here. Then we could go ahead and divide delta X over. And this is where things get exciting. So we went ahead and divided delta X over. And then we went ahead and put it in our column vector, uh, this column vector. And now we have this thing that looks like the uh, difference quotient. So F1 of X plus delta X comma Y minus F1 of X comma Y divide by delta X. Or F2 of X plus delta X comma Y minus F2 of X Y divide by delta X. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and apply the limit as delta X approaches zero because we know that these are the definitions of partial derivatives by the difference quotient. 
And of course, this one ends up being the definition of the partial derivative of F1 with respect to X. And this one ends up being the partial derivative of F2 with respect to X. And so what we found now is that if you take the Jacobian operator and you times it by the column vector one zero, what you get out of that operation is the column vector uh, del F1 del X over del F2 del X. Now we're gonna do the same thing with this with this operation over here where we map the E2 vector to the E2 prime vector. And once again, we pull out the delta Y from the top and bottom of the column vector. We divide it over to the other side and we apply the limit. And now we have like here in this column vector, F1 of X comma Y plus delta Y minus F1 of X and Y divided by delta Y. The limit as delta Y approaches zero. Well, that's nothing more than the partial derivative of F1 with respect to Y. Similar thing with this lower entry of this column vector. The limit as delta Y approaches zero of this entry is del F2 del Y. So the partial derivative of F2 with respect to Y. So what that means is if you take the Jacobian matrix and you times it by the column vector zero one, the uh, output is going to be the partial derivative of F1 with respect to Y over the partial derivative of F2 with respect to Y. From this information, we can surmise that the Jacobian matrix is equal to, uh, the first row is del F1 del X, del F1 del Y, and the second row is del F2 del X, del F2 del Y. So we have now found the Jacobian matrix. And the Jacobian matrix, once again, will give us the basis vectors at any point in the range of our nonlinear or linear mapping. So if you're, if you're finding the Jacobian of a, say, a linear mapping, then all the entries are going to be constant. Whereas if you are finding the Jacobian of a nonlinear uh, operator, then these entries are going to not be constant. So once again, uh, just looking up at this picture again, uh, for this original map in the Cartesian plane, you can use the same basis vectors anywhere, right? There's E1, there's E2. It works for all points in this space. But when we apply nonlinear operator A to all the points in the X, Y plane, you end up with a space where if you move, if you move around, you're going to need different basis vectors for whatever point you're at. What the Jacobian does is it allows you to figure out essentially what those basis vectors for any point in this space is, um, which is super useful. And two of the main uses I can think of, um, one in calculus three would be change of variables for integrating. So recall that the determinant between two vectors is actually the area that is enclosed by the parallelogram of those two vectors. And so say that you want to change your variables for integrating, maybe it's gonna make your integration easier. The issue is, is that for some linear or nonlinear transformation, um, your given infinitesimal area will actually change in scale based on the transformation, whether it's linear or nonlinear. And so in other words, you need to use the determinant of the Jacobian as a scaling factor of infinitesimal areas. That way you're getting um, the units you want from the original uh, variables and not for the changed variables. The other use I can think of is um, testing the stability of steady states for differential equations. And in that case, you will actually use eigenvalues to determine whether you're at a minimum potential, a maximum potential, or a saddle, which of course would be stable, unstable, and unstable. So I think I'll do other videos about how the Jacobian applies in these two cases, but I just thought this was really interesting and I hope this helps you think about what the Jacobian operator is doing. So I appreciate you watching and I'll see you next video.